Thanks for joining us on Wellness Talk Radio. I'm Chris Costello, and today we are talking with Dr. Gary Kaplan. Dr. Kaplan, thank you so much for joining us. Chris, thank you for having me here today. You are the author of Total Recovery, How We Get Sick, Why We Stay Sick, and How We Can Recover. And one of the first things that caught my eye in Chapter 1 was your quote by Leonardo da Vinci, Study the art of science. Learn how to see. Realize that everything connects to everything else. And when I read Total Recovery, your story about how you came to these these realizations is, is really profound. Thank you. The, uh, you know, the, the craziness that we've had in medicine is that we treat things as parts. We've taken everything apart. We've become so subspecialized that we have lost sight of the totality of the whole. And we keep thinking that things happen in isolation. And in fact, they don't. They happen on a continuum. And this process of getting sick usually isn't an event, but really is a process. And so what we frequently think is the beginning isn't the beginning. And so an example of that would be uh, a young woman that I saw uh, a number of years ago who developed generalized pain syndrome. She was depressed. She had pain everywhere. And uh, she was a teenager who had been out of high school. And uh, she had been through a number of different pain centers. And they'd been treating the pain, which started from her getting a soccer injury, which uh, kick in the knee. The knee swelled, the knee became progressively uh, more painful, and over time the pain generalized to her entire body. And what should have healed and would have healed in the rest of us inside of a matter of uh, weeks didn't heal at all in her over years. And so she had progressive interventions trying to fix this thing. And eventually, uh, when we got a chance to see her, we took a little bit further, more extensive history on her. And one of the things we found on her was that she had had Lyme disease twice, about five years prior to this incident, and had had a case of a poisonous spider bite, uh, also about four years prior to this incident. So we asked whether or not toxins, as a result of those bites, had built up in her system. And sure enough, that is in fact what had happened to her. She had biotoxicity disorder. And that was the setup for her nervous system to take one last blow that went over the top and ended up with this generalized horrific pain problem. When we addressed the biotoxic component of it, then everything got better. And so, Dr. Kaplan, it's fascinating how you, your history of working in medicine, you've been an integrative physician, and you've done tremendous amounts of research. How did you come to understand some of these things about chronic pain? Well, first and foremost, it's about listening to the patient. One of the things that was extremely useful to me, though, is my acupuncture background. So in acupuncture, acupuncture sees things as evolving in the system and operating on a continuum. In Western medicine, we too often think of things as events and not as a process that's occurred in the body. And so uh, the acupuncture background had me constantly wondering what else was going on with these people. What is it we were missing? Where did the problem really start? And increasingly, I was seeing people coming in with more and more complex problems, people with depression along with chronic pain. And we were having a miserable time treating them, frankly. They were not getting better. And so the question was, what was going on with these people? Uh, That even though our best efforts at at treating each individual symptom, we might have some minor success, we were not getting success in treating the whole person. And so we were constantly striving to understand how a disease evolved in somebody and how we could translate what I knew from my acupuncture training into my Western training. One of the things that really stood out in Total Recovery is you talk about the patients that uh, came to you uh, at your Integrative Medicine Center, and most of them had seen, I think it was something like 8 to 15 physicians without having any resolution. Is that right? That's correct. Unfortunately, many of the people we see have seen a large number of physicians or, and or centers. They've been seen at Mayo Clinic or Cleveland Clinic, uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, and again, I think problem comes in that we keep looking, they frequently see the specialist, the subspecialist, and they look at smaller and smaller pieces as opposed to getting the totality of the whole picture of what's going on with this individual. I had a patient recently who uh, needed a heart valve replaced at the Cleveland Clinic, and I had uh, treated her for migraines, and uh, one of the medications I use to treat her is a medication we commonly use for treating uh, high blood pressure, Uh, but it also happens to be very effective in certain types of migraines. The cardiologist, while when she was admitted to Cleveland Clinic, looked at her medication list and said, why are you on a blood pressure medication? And she said, it's for a migraine. And he said to her, 
that's one of our drugs. Why would you use that for a migraine? No understanding that these medications have systemic effects, that they affect multiple systems of the body, and that uh, they may have actually lots of different uses, <laughs> aside from just treating high blood pressure. Right. But that's also true of the herbs, and that's also true uh, of a lot of the interventions we use. They can have profound effects on the entire system, and we need to pay attention to that. The major thing from total recovery that, that you talk about, Dr. Kaplan, is you, know, you argue that we've been thinking of the nature of pain all wrong. And what do you mean by that? So we think of pain, and frequently uh, chronic pain in particular, which is different than acute pain. Chronic pain's been around long after uh, healing should have occurred. Uh, And in chronic pain situations, we think of it as the thing. What is it that, where does it hurt? The shoulder hurts, the, the low back hurts. And we don't realize that what's happened in people is that there's an inflammation that's occurred in the central nervous system. And that really what we're looking at now is a symptom, okay, not a disease, but a symptom of inflammation in the central nervous system, symptom of a brain on fire. And if we look at it from that perspective, then we start asking a whole bunch of different questions about how the person got there and what's maintaining the pain. How does the the neurophysiology of chronic pain work? I mean, what does that look like? So when we began our, our investigation into this, the question was exactly that. What is it that's common to all of these things? What's causing inflammation in the brain? Because inflammation is a lot of different things in different parts of the body. In the brain, the inflammation is controlled by a small cell called the microglia. And the microglia is the innate immune system of the central nervous system. So whenever there's any damage to the brain, and that damage can be caused by extended periods of stress, or it can be caused by uh, physical trauma, concussion. Uh, it can be caused by loss of oxygen to the brain, which occurs in people who have sleep apnea. That's about 5% of the population. And the estimates are that only about 15% of the people who suffer with sleep apnea have actually been diagnosed. So we have all these traumas, and they tend to be cumulative in terms of damage to the brain, and they cause the microglia to excrete substances which are inflammatory. They cause inflammation in the tissues around them, swelling and tissue destruction. And so what happens over an extended period of time is the, you see more and more tissue damage, and you actually see loss of brain matter. So these, t- these conditions are not only neuroinflammatory, uh, but they're neurodegenerative. We actually see loss of brain tissue. So it's really important to be able to get to these things sooner than later. The longer, you know, my 15-year-olds, my 20-year-olds heal completely. My 50-year-olds, my 60-year-olds who've been in pain and and struggling with depression for 20, 30, 40 years, frequently we get incomplete results on them. We get better than nothing, but it's much better if we get to it sooner because there is ongoing uh, damage to the brain uh, as a result of this inflammation. So, Dr. Kaplan, let's talk a little bit about what would the average person experience if they, if they are in chronic pain and they, they go to their physician. Uh, what's the most likely scenario? And then let's talk a little bit about what have you seen that actually works and how can people really deal with this pain syndrome that you're, you're describing? So the most likely scenario in a conventional medical office, the physician doesn't have much time to talk to you to begin with. So that the whole appointment may be nothing more than eight minutes which is not enough time to really examine uh, and get the history of what needs to be determined why you're sick. Nevertheless, the tendency will be to give you some kind of either identify what it is that is hurting at that moment in time. You may get an injection, a steroid injection. You may get a medication for pain relief. Uh, and that may be in the form of a, a non or it may be in the form of a narcotic medication. Uh, and or if the migraine, you might get a form of uh, something that will relieve the migraine acutely, uh, or you might get something that will, uh, a medication that will be longer lasting. If you've got somebody a little bit more sophisticated with pain, they may try some medications such as the anti-seizure medications or some of the uh, antidepressant medications, which are also effective uh, in the treatment of some pain conditions. That's pretty much as far as things will go at that point in time for most, uh, for most physicians. If you want to really take uh, if you really want to get to the root of what's going on, you have to spend the time to sit and listen. So my initial appointments with people are anywhere from an hour and a half to two hours. And we take a completely comprehensive history. So we want to know how you're sleeping. I want to know what your digestion is like and how your bowels are working. I want to know uh, whether or not there's any history of heart or lung disease. I want to know 
uh, any issues of psychological trauma. I want to know your whole family history uh, and get an understanding of what life has been like for you. So my first question with people is typically, uh, when was the last time you felt really great? When was the last time you felt totally energetic? When was the last time you felt in excellent health? And the first thing most people do is they lie to me. They say, oh, you know, I was in excellent health until five years ago. Five years ago, my stomach started to hurt, and I remember I was on uh, Easter Sunday. We had had this party. I thought that I had gotten food poisoning, and uh, my stomach's been bothering me ever since. I've had, you know, X number of gastroenterology workups and other physicians that I've seen, uh, and nobody can figure out what the problem is. And then you sit and you say, okay, uh, now, any history of headaches? Well, yeah, as a matter of fact, I've had migraines since I was 12. When my period started. Okay, how often do you get those? And then the history starts to evolve out. And then we start finding, well, you know, any history of depression? Well, yes. In fact, uh, I've had problems with depression on and off, but I'm taking an antidepressant right now, and so it's well controlled. And then you find that people have been sick for a very long time, and that, no, it didn't start five years ago. Rather, it started probably 30 years ago. And now you start working forward and starting to understand the conditions that people were living in and what was going on in their lives. Uh, to understand the totality of how they got sick and why they're staying sick. Basically, you're saying, though, that, that chronic pain, you can't look at one simple answer. You've got to look at the whole history of that person's experience. If people aren't getting better from the therapies, then you need to step back and you need to say, okay, what am I missing? And then you need to think in a global sense of what's going on with this individual and what's potentially maintaining their pain. So one example is uh, a woman who came in who had uh, was diagnosed with fibromyalgia starting with a car accident uh, when she was about 18 years old. And she's now in her 30s. Uh, she's been treated uh, with the conventional methods uh, for treating fibromyalgia without much success for uh, a large number of years. And so she was seeing me, what else could I do for her neck pain and, and the rest of the body pain that she was experiencing. So we started taking a more comprehensive history on her, and one of the things we found is when she was 12 years old, she had been raped. And she never told anybody about this. And as she's telling me about this for the first time, she's breaking down, she's sobbing, she's literally reliving the experience. And I explained to her that that was really the beginnings of what set her brain on fire, what set an inflammation in her central nervous system. And that because that was never processed, she still had post-traumatic stress syndrome. So because that was never processed, the rest of the, the next blow to her, which occurred several years later with this car accident, is what finally tipped her over into having this horrible chronic pain situation. When we addressed the post-traumatic stress component of her problem and then did the muscle skeletal work and other, some other nutritional work with her, basically the entire problem resolved. But it wasn't going to fix until we uh, had identified that, that first issue, and in her case, it was a rape. So you have to go really, really back into the patient's history, it sounds like. You have to be willing to sit and listen, and you have to be able to take a very extensive history. And you've got to believe that the mind and the body are connected and that they were not separate things. Too often what we do is we say, okay, this is a psychological problem, so it has nothing to do with me because... I'm a specialist in back pain, and so you need to go see the psychiatrist. Uh, and too many of my patients have been sent to the psychiatrist, and it's almost as an act of dismissal. Not almost. It is an act of dismissal in, in a number of these patients. where They come to me where they're told, okay, we can't find a reason for your pain, so you must be crazy, so go see the psychiatrist. And that story I've heard way too many times. Uh, and so... You really have to be respectful of people and understand that mind and body are one and that it's seamless. And you have to be able to understand how they integrate and how they influence each other. And so once you start getting answers to this puzzle when you, when you treat the, the patient, when you work with the patient, what are the steps? What kind of things do you do that uh, really help, uh, help people get pain relief? So, again, you've got to identify all of the potential issues that are going on with a given individual. So uh, one woman I was working with uh, was getting severe migraines and panic attacks, and I talk about her in the book, and it turned out with her the issue was gluten intolerance, and not true celiac disease, but gluten intolerance. And 
as opposed to focusing on her, her headaches, we should have been focusing on, and we did, on what she was eating. And when we found that, uh, basically all her symptoms of the anxiety and the headaches went away. So history, history, history is, is the single most important thing to do with people. The next thing is a good, thorough physical exam. Uh, and then laboratory testing, we're looking at all of the potential things that could have set up an inflammatory process with people. Did you have problems where you were living in a moldy building and exposed uh, to mold, and you have uh, genetics that doesn't allow you to process the mold toxins? Have you had tick bites and potentially have Lyme disease? We've identified many patients, uh, working with a woman recently, who's got Lyme and some associated diseases, who's been through five years of treatments for her migraines unsuccessfully. No one bothered to check. Uh, we have people who have sleep apnea. We, find a, we, we screen our patients and we do a thorough sleep history on people, trying to understand uh, if this is contributing to their problem. So you've really got to cast a wide net, and you've got to treat individually. There's no one pill, one answer for all of these problems. Everything has to be individualized, uh, but everything can be individualized, especially if we know the physiology of the microglia and what is it is that sets them off. And then we can start step by step understanding what it is that's keeping them in an inflammatory state and what we need to do in order to quell that inflammation. Let's talk a little bit about gluten-free because it's it's almost a craze now. You know, it's as with all things health-related, these things seem to get popular and then they go away and that kind of thing. Uh, tell me more about, you know, how do people know whether it's going to be beneficial for them to be on a gluten-free diet? Do they need to get testing? You know, how do they how do they do that? We need to make a distinction between celiac disease and gluten intolerance. Celiac disease is an autoimmune disease, and it affects about 1% of the population. And those people, it's a simple blood test that can be done in order to determine uh, if they have a celiac disease. The more definitive test is uh, an endoscopy where we take a scope down and look in the uh, small intestine and see whether or not we see uh, atrophy of the, of the villi in there that are consistent with the diagnosis of celiac disease. And in those individuals, they can't be around gluten in any way, shape, or form uh, for the rest of their lives at that point. Uh, in people who have gluten intolerance, that's, we estimate somewhere between 6 to 8% of the population probably has gluten intolerance. And we have no way of testing in terms of specific blood tests for that. So the only way you can determine if you're gluten intolerant is by eliminating gluten from your diet and seeing if you feel better. I recommend that people go on a diet of rice, fish, chicken, fresh fruits, and vegetables for a period of six weeks. Now, that eliminates not only gluten, but it also eliminates dairy, soy, uh, and refined sugars, so that we're pulling out the major things that people are sensitive to from their diet. They may be sensitive to other things, but once you get rid of the big things, you can begin to have increased sensitivity to other foods that may be bothering you. So by eliminating the big things and seeing how you feel, do your joint pains get better? Do you, does your energy improve? Does that brain fog go away? Uh, and do you find that the indigestion you've had, where you've had gas and bloating, or that you've had irregular bowel movements, you're tending toward constipation, you're looking around for all of how do you feel? Are you getting better on that diet? Do you feel better on that diet or don't you? And then you're also looking to say, well, wait a minute, I ate corn the other day, and when I ate corn, I felt bloated and uncomfortable. So corn may be another thing that you're sensitive to, and you have to eliminate that as well. And so as you doing these elimination diets are really the most sensitive way to determine whether or not you have a problem with those foods. And another of the promising treatments that uh, is talked a lot about on the Internet uh, recently uh, is LDN for the autoimmune conditions and people in pain. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Dr. Kaplan? So the low-dose naltrexone, I use a great deal of low-dose naltrexone. Naltrexone is a medication which uh, in high doses is used for uh, reversing narcotic overdose from morphine. Uh, in minuscule doses, and we're using somewhere between 1.25 to 4.5 milligrams. Uh, those dosages uh, actually downregulate the microglia. They cause the microglia to move from an inflammatory to a resting state. And so that's one of the ways that, uh, that they're being effective. And we use, uh, we use in any situation in which we think there's inflammation in the central nervous system, uh, I will utilize uh, low-dose naltrexone, and we find it to be a fairly benign drug, meaning most people tolerate it very well, uh, though there are some people that can have allergic reactions to it those people, we can't use it. Uh, but it
It's otherwise a very safe drug, and I've used it in small children as well as in adults uh, for treating a wide range of different conditions, inclusive of autoimmune diseases such as chronic disease. And are they uh, are there uh, side effects or things that people should be aware of? So the overwhelming majority of people will not have any side effect whatsoever from the medication. Uh, they take the medication. You take it at bedtime because it tends to make you a little bit sleepy, so it'll actually improve your sleep. But otherwise, uh, the people who are allergic to it, sensitive to it, can have pretty severe headaches, can have vertigo with things spinning, nausea, and you typically get that response within the first dose or two of the medication. And in those circumstances, you don't take the medication any, again. So that we simply say you're allergic to it and no go. But pretty much everyone else, uh, I've not had any significant problems with the drug. I find it very safe. It's a medication that has to be compounded because it doesn't come in that small a dose, meaning that you have to go to a pharmacist who knows how to make up the medication at that dosage. Right, and it's likely that if you're uh, with a con- conventional doctor, they may not know about it. They may need to get some information on it before they'll prescribe, right? That would be absolutely correct. But there is good literature uh, in the National Library of Public Medicine. Not a lot of it, but there's some talking specifically about use of low-dose naltrexone for the treatment of fibromyalgia. There's a literature talking about low-dose naltrexone helping people with Crohn's disease. So there are studies showing that low-dose naltrexone is effective in both autoimmune and pain conditions. Uh, and if you're phys- you can find those studies by going to PubMed, P-U-B-M-E-D, uh, and searching the National Library of Medicine. That's available to anybody for free. Uh, and presenting those studies to your physician. We cite a number of those studies in the book, so they're referenced uh, in total recovery. And so that would be a potentially another resource for people. And now, Dr. Kaplan, another thing that's very uh, much in the news on the Internet lately are uh, this kind of rise in thyroid deficiency. Do you find any correlation with a lot of your patients having that? Yeah, endocrine issues are very important to address as well. Uh, one of the things we find in uh, women who become postmenopausal about 20% of them will develop generalized joint pain and muscle pain from the estrogen withdrawal. And in those circumstances, giving them back estrogen uh, actually gets rid of the pain problem. Uh, But otherwise, absolutely, uh, chronic pain uh, and chronic depression, which are very commonly occur together, you see about a 60% co-occurrence of both pain and depression. You see problems in the uh, hypothalamic uh, pituitary thyroid axis. And so the thyroid is, even if it looks like it's normal, it may be uh, a functional uh, low thyroid. And you can, you need to test uh, free uh, T3 and T4. So there's specific testing that needs to be done uh, in order to look at thyroid. Simply looking at a TSH is not adequate. Uh, also, we believe that looking at a TSH, the thyroid stimulating hormone, that should be about 2.5 or below. Uh, and right now the norms are set at about four and a half, and I think that's a little bit too high. I think that people are are, evi- are showing evidence of functional hypothyroidism uh, with dry skin, fatigue, difficulty with sleep, uh, brittle nails, and in those individuals, giving them uh, a small amount of thyroid replacement can be a world of difference in terms of both helping them with their pain, but also with other issues in their life. And I know a lot of people, uh, they come to you that uh, are struggling with depression. And why do you think, you know, I mean, what are the rates of depression in this, co- in this country? And what do you think is going on? And what do you think about antidepressants and how much those are being prescribed? So, you know, that's a really wonderful and a huge topic, Chris, because the other thing that we're looking at is what's going on recently with all this gun violence that's happening and we have these Uh, individuals, many of whom have been identified as suffering with depression or other psychiatric illnesses, they're under treatment, and yet they're not getting better and clearly then go out and commit these horrific acts of violence. What we know is that about, is about uh, 30, off the top of my head, I'm saying about 30 million people suffering, no, that's incorrect, there's about 18 million people who are suffering with major depressive disorder every year. There's about... uh, 52 million people who are suffering combined with anxiety disorders, dysthymic disorders, and major depressive disorders. Uh, As far as response to antidepressant medication, only about a third of people with depression actually respond to antidepressant medication. And overall, if you combine antidepressant medication and cognitive behavioral therapy, while the numbers go up, 
we still look at a failure rate of about 40%. And I believe the reason we're seeing that is because in all cases of depression, it's not, and we treat, it, we treat depression as, as disease when I think it's a symptom. It's a symptom of a brain on, fly, on fire, a symptom of inflammation in the central nervous system. Similar mechanism to what's going on with chronic pain, and that's why there's so much overlap between the medications that work for pain and the medications that work uh, for, for depression. I think there is a place for antidepressants in the treatment of these conditions, but at the same time, I think we need to be very thorough in looking for potential other causes of the inflammation. So I have a 17-year-old who came to see me with severe depressive disorder, who was suicidally depressed, who'd been in and out of psychiatric hospitals, uh, and everybody was kind of beside themselves trying to figure out how they were going to help this kid. And when, when I saw him, I asked, okay, what else might be causing inflammation for him? In his case, the answer was celiac disease. And when we identified the fact that he, had cili- he was suffering from celiac disease, and that this was a neuropsychiatric manifestation of celiac disease, his depression went away. We took him off gluten, uh, and we've slowly but surely been weaning him off his antidepressant medications. It takes a while for the brain to recover after it's been inflamed for a period of time, but it can recover. And I'm curious, does it ever recover and you can actually add some of these things back? Or are people talking about, a, you know, I mean, I know for celiac, no, you can't. But for some of the more mild behavioral disorders, do you see that ever, or is that just people have to stay on a strict, you know, gluten-free kind so, of routine? So, again, it becomes a complex issue because what is it that set the problem off? And many of these people have leaky gut. And so if you have a leaky gut, one of the things that happens is you have large molecules of food which are moving out of the gut into the bloodstream. The body doesn't like that. And what it does is it builds uh, antibodies to those large molecules of food. So you then start having sensitivities to a huge number of foods. Uh, and what we have to do is first look for bacterial or yeast overgrowth of what's going on in the gut. We have to eliminate the foods that you're presently sensitive to. And then we have to do things in order to allow the gut to repair the inflammation to go down. And when that happens over time, frequently within a, a year typically, you can then start to reintroduce some of the foods that people were previously sensitive to, and with the gut completely healed, they're no longer sensitive to those foods. So in, in some cases, uh, the foods can be added back in, but you're judicious in, in adding them back in, and you do so one at a time so that you're clear about uh, whether or not you're developing a reaction to anything. And Dr. Kaplan, I don't want to give away the entire recipe in the book here, uh, but uh, you know, hopefully people will uh, get a copy of Total Recovery and, and find out for themselves. But what are some of the just critical things that people need to do if they're suffering from uh, chronic pain or uh, autoimmune conditions? What, what's the first few steps they should take? The very first step is I would sit down and uh, do a comprehensive history on yourself. Be honest. When, how long has it been that you've been sick? What's gone on throughout your life? And you do several timelines. You look at a timeline in terms of major life events. Have there been major moves, marriages, divorces? Uh, and put that on a timeline. Then you can put a timeline in terms of major illnesses that have occurred, surgeries uh, or illnesses such as pneumonia or onset of uh, migraine uh, or any other illness that's occurred, pneumonia. Uh, and... Then what you want to do and see if there's a point at which, as you're looking through those timelines, uh, where it is you found that you were staying sick on a regular basis, where the fatigue began, where you found that you couldn't exercise the way you used to. And that's the beginning of understanding of how the, the process evolved within you. And you can do that on your own. You can then take that information to your physician and ask them about it. And hopefully you're going to find a physician who's open minded and will sit to be able to Uh, talk with you long enough to understand that history and then begin to understand what other additional questions need to be asked. So the first thing I would tell you is don't assume that the beginning is the beginning. Take a look and see whether or not other things were happening beforehand that were the setup for what ultimately developed into a chronic pain or chronic depressive situation. The next thing I would tell you is that you really need to be uh, practicing meditation on a regular basis. 
Meditation can be a very effective means of reducing inflammation in the central nervous system, and it actually helps regenerate new nerve tissue. So a regular practice of meditation can be extremely beneficial for you. Diet, as we've already discussed, is extremely important. And so doing an elimination diet on your own at home can be done quite simply, and then keeping a diary, paying attention to what reaction you're having to what foods. So that's the beginning of that process of beginning to understand how you got sick and why you're staying sick, and also beginning to understand uh, how you can, things you can do for yourself for healing. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaplan. Chris, it's been a pleasure, and uh, I'm delighted to have been able to be here today. Thank you.